great. Postural symptoms without tachycardia. The answer is it depends. There's not a clear answer. Um, in the patients I see, I guess, you know, you could divide it into a group where um, there is clearly a lot of tachycardia-like symptoms. So there's, you know, palpitation, orthostatic lightheadedness, often with palpitation, heart rates that don't quite meet the criteria, but are close. Um, and often we'll start with similar approaches in that case, um, where we'll get, you know, the blood volume up and we'll, um, if the blood pressure is low, maybe use a drug like mitogen to squish the vessels a bit. I'm not sure if that works as well if someone has symptoms of lightheadedness um, and their heart rate doesn't go up at all, right? Or it goes up very minimally. So if their heart rate goes up five to 10 points, which is, you know, quite normal, I'm not sure that the same strategies work. And, and so that's the challenge. I think all of these um, clusters encompass different groups and there may not be one answer for everyone. <sighs> So the patients we see with, you know, if we're worried about uh, sort of cardiovascular dysautonomia, or tachy you know, the tachycardia subset, um, the symptoms are usually regular, right? They're usually daily or at least almost daily, um, often every time you stand up. Um, so if, if the issue is there's occasional lightheadedness, um, occasional orthostatic intolerance, you know, that actually um, could be a form of reflex fainting or vasovagal syncope. Right? So by definition, to have vasovagal syncope, syncope means you fainted. But before people faint, they go through this sort of hemodynamic um, set of changes and go through typically a feeling of feeling like you're about to faint before the fainting reaction fully um, dumps the blood pressure. And there are some people that get to that stage and then they don't faint. Um, so it, it's probably not POTS, but you know it may be another disorder that we can try and target. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure the audience is going to like the answer. Um, so in the POTS world, so if we if we're looking at patients that have excessive tachycardia, they get the same advice, right? And I will tell you there there's little study data on this um, because in that uh, Dallas study where they looked at just about everything, they did not do two day CPETs, right? So we don't actually have, you know, the objective data. But I can tell you from having, you know, recommended their exercise approach and refining their exercise approach for, for over a decade now, um, that the questioner is absolutely right. There are, you know, I'd say the majority of POTS patients when they're starting treatment describe, again, not with two-day CPAP, but just from history, you know, what would be post-exertional malaise. Um, and, you know, if people are able to get through this program, actually, it seems to improve, right? It's not a cure, right? I mean, people regress, right? But I've had, and and we've had challenges with patients, like in the long COVID um, sort of overlap group where patients are seeing different clinics and it may have been a miscommunication, it may not have, right? But I've had a patient that started this and then was told to stop, right? And then she came back to me and actually said that she had actually started getting better and then felt worse again, right? But initially with the PM, they will feel worse, they'll feel miserable when they start exercising. Um, but after several weeks, that actually can get better. Now, that's I'm not generalizing that to everyone that is post-exertional malaise, right? Because the truth is my experience is only in the subgroup that has excessive tachycardia. And the physiology might be different in the different subgroups. Yeah, so there are almost a few questions in there, right? So if, if the issue is someone's developed, uh, someone has POTS, do you need to get an echo? The answer is no. Um, what you need to do as, as a physician, what your physician needs to do is be able to be confident that the heart, there's no structural abnormality, right? So there's not a cardiomyopathy, um, which, you know, can happen, right? I mean, so POTS can sometimes develop during pregnancy. And it turns out one of the other things that can develop in pregnancy is something called the peripartum cardiomyopathy. Um, and so you don't want to miss that. So if, but I mean, that's sometimes discernible with the ECG and a good cardiac exam. But sometimes even after the exam, you can't tell, in which case you should get an echo. Um, but the EDS thing is, is the wild card, right? And I think it, here it depends on what type of EDS. Um, so certainly patients with vascular EDS, the answer is yeah, absolutely, right? Because this group is at particularly high risk of um, aortopathies and you know things like that, right? So the echo would be recommended, not so much for the heart, but to follow you know, the aortic root and make sure that it's not getting too big and it structurally looks intact. 
if someone has um, a hypermobile form of EDS, you know, and again, in my experience, the, that's the bulk of the EDS patients I see are in the hypermobile group. Um, that doesn't tend to have progressive aortic valve disease, right? So I'm not sure a routine, ser routine serial echoes are needed in that group. So the HSD thing, I'm going to, uh, I, I expect that there are other speakers here that probably are, you know, more familiar with the resources. I know there are different groups trying to pull together physician lists ranging from the EDS Society and, and uh, some EDS Society, but I think there's some national Canadian efforts to try and pull in people with expertise, um, especially around sort of joint stabilization and things like that. In terms of the POTS related things, you know, I'm totally biased because you know, I was on the writing committee for the Canadian Cardiovascular Society position statement, but I actually um, think it's actually a fairly good guide. Um, and it was designed purposely um, to be accessible to a family physician. And that's not because I don't think specialists should look after um, patients with POTS or with EDS or both. But the truth is, while we have a shortage of family physicians, most people can get to their family physician more easily than they can get to a specialist. And so we wanted to try and make the care accessible. Um, the other thing that they may want to read if, if the, doc, the position statement's too detailed and too long is there's a review in the CMAJ, Canadian Medical Association Journal. I want to say it was either 2021 or 2022. So in the last couple of years on POTS and you know, I swear the editors should have gotten co-authorship because they helped us rewrite half of it to make it something that a family doctor would find understandable and usable. So I think that would be probably a good place to, for them to start. 